All right, well, welcome class. Uh, we're gonna do a catch up on week six and then week seven, and we have uh, a few questions for each of these weeks. So week six uh, was chapters 10 and 11, so we're gonna start with FE. Um, and maybe what we'll do is uh, Susie will read the question and then Susie and I will discuss it, and then uh, we'll go from there. So Susie, why don't you go ahead and read the FE Sure, question. I will. This is from Effie. Does the brand image favor a brand extension? And does the brand extension fit the parent brand? Okay, so brand image, um, generally speaking, brand extension is just that. You're, you're creating an, a, a modified product of your existing product. Uh, think of the Flex Seal ads you see on television. Flex Seal started off um, as a glue, and now they've got uh, it by the gallon, they've got it in a soft texture, they've got tape, they've got uh, all kinds of different, and those, if you notice, it's got the same branding, it's just an extension. You're extending that product, that, that particular product into other applications. So. Brand image favor brand extension. It it by necessity has to. If if the fellow that invented um, that Flex Seal had invented a whole new name like double bonded tape, you don't get the benefit of that uh, branding to help with the extension. It's a it's as if you're starting a brand new line or a brand new product. And then uh, does the brand extension fit the parent brand? By by definition, it has to or it's not an extension. It, it, it has to model. That's my view on it. And Susie, maybe you've got something different on it, mm -hmm. but that's my view. Yes, I really don't have anything different, Steve, but I do think that um, when we talk about um, brand extension, if, if the um, branding is in high regard with the, with the public or the consumer, your extension definitely is going to be more popular. So if you have a very well established and well thought of um, brand in the first place, your extensions then again too will be much more uh -huh, stable and will produce more revenue. Yeah, maybe maybe an odd way to think of it is that if if you use my example of Flex Seal, if you know how <laughs> he is uh, driving a boat that's made out of his <laughs> material, if if on the TV commercial a boat actually sank and didn't float. Then, if he created a, a brand extension, he would want to put Flex Seal on that brand because that would be dead in the water. So, anyway, that's my Literally. joke of the day. Yeah. So, all right. Well, good. How, how about that? Can you read Dietra's question so that we? You bet. I would be happy to. Um, Deirdre says, or asks rather, can you explain the difference between an undifferentiated targeting strategy and a single market segment being targeted? Okay. Well, Susie, do you have, maybe you could start with this one. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to, yes. Um, when you're talking about a, differ a differentiated marketing um, strategy, you, you focus on the entire target market instead of just a segment of that market. Um, the people that are customers or consumers that are involved in the target market will have um, common characteristics um, and similar needs for the product, actually. Um, in the past, um, it has been much more easily used because we didn't have all the technology. Now we couldn't break down the distribution systems and now we have so many types of products out there that it does become um, a, a little bit more difficult to use as a marketing tool unless your product is needed by all, all, almost everyone. Um, things such as like sugar and salt and those kinds of items. Okay. Um, when, when you're talking about a segmented market, you're talking more about a concentrated focused group. So the, the, the segment is um, broken down by um, marketing professionals uh, in, in a much tighter area. So you're concentrating more. They, they actually evaluate um, each segment um, and use, they use that segment when they are looking at the needs of that segment. Um, the, the demographics of that segment, the age, and so on. So it becomes much more concentrated and focused as to what type of um, product you're going to, as how you're going to use your marketing dollars. 
That's great. Um, the only thing I would maybe add to that, in Effie's question about brand extension, uh, Nike's always a, a great uh, example for case studies. And um, you would think that a Nike brand would, would have a lot of value to it if, as if Nike gets into different types of sports and related areas, um, they would want to put the Nike brand on it. But what they did do is they, they uh, found a single market and they decided not to do a brand extension on that. And for many, for a long time, people didn't associate this brand with Nike. And part of the reason for that, and I'll tell you what the brand is in a minute here, is that, that Nike was measuring some uh, pushback or anti-Nike feelings in the market that, that with the Nike brand, it was the man, it was the corporation, it wasn't unique, it wasn't interesting. And a lot of their market was starting to think, gee, well, it must be something more uh, independent and free out there and not so corporate like Nike. So what Nike decided to do, they wanted to get into the skateboarding side of the market, so that single market, and they created a brand called Hurley. And suddenly the market started buying Hurley ironic t-shirts and Hurley equipment and Hurley. Nike's wholly owned by Nike, or Hurley's not Nike, wholly owned by Nike. And it, nobody figured it out right away, but everybody embraced the idea of Hurley because it was new and different and not Nike. So you, corporations play these games both ways, um, but that's an interesting kind of uh, way to look at a single market where corporations actually in a very undifferentiated uh, organization in terms of marketing to many, many. Well, and I think too, Steve, that a lot of customers that, that um, you know, associate with Nike or, or feel like, you know, Nike is the best, whatever that is, you know, th this kind of, in a way, opens up a new market for Nike, one that hasn't even been discovered yet. And people yeah. that are mm -hmm. kind of, it, 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 it don't want to have anything to do with Nike end up buying Nike product when they don't realize what it is. So, right. you know, kind of get you coming and going. It right? does. <laughs> well, and, and they were, uh, they were watching <clears throat> some of their, their market share shrink, <clears throat> pardon me, because it was going to, um, under Armour, for example. So this is a way to kind of confuse the market a little bit and stop that that migration. And uh, it's really quite interesting how they went about it. So yeah, it's it can work both ways. Is that um, called backdoor tactics? Yeah, or maybe <laughs> maybe uh, a front door, it's a team tag where you go in the front door and someone's going in the back door at the same time. <laughs> uh, get you coming and going, like I said. How there about um, how about Brody? It's Brody's. Okay. Um, Brody asks, what does it mean when it says a product may be defined as everything, and what context is it putting it towards? Okay, and you know sometimes it's a little hard to kind of discern what the because the question can be broad in some sense. But I mean, what what's your take on it, Susie? On his well, my whole take is that in in this context, Brody what they're trying to explain to you is that anything that you can exchange for something else is actually it is actually a product so that being said generally um our society thinks of a product as tangible something you can touch and that's not always entirely true it can also be a service um when you get your shoes polished or your car washed or that kind of thing. So that can also be a product. But something that we overlook a lot of the times is that an idea can be a product. So the concept is actually a product and you can exchange that and sell that. So I'm thinking that when you talk about a tangible product, we're talking about oh, um, shoes, for instance. And then when we're talking about um, a non-tangible product or a service would be something that I just described to getting your nails done or your car washed. And then when you talk about a concept or an idea of something, it could be like, especially in advertising, um, like um, don't litter or that kind of thing. So just about anything when you really get down to it can actually be a product. Yeah, it, it, those lines were are blurred for sure. I mean, it used to yes. be pretty simple. If, if you could touch it and feel that it was a tangible product, if it wasn't something that was tangible, it was a service, but it's it's become more complex for sure. Um, yeah, good. Um, it's an interesting question because the market moves around and the market basically decides what's a product and what's a service. 
not the company. So it's it's a little interesting battle going on. Um, well, I think consumer demand also does too. It defines that, I think, too, Steve, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you know, and, and you said, I mean, it used to be you pick up a textbook and there was products and services and that was it. Today you pick it up, there's product services and ideas. And one way to think of ideas is consultants basically sell ideas. They're not selling a tangible product. They're not really providing a service in, in the sense of a true service, but they're problem solving. So there's that third new dimension about ideas out there that, that are kind of being sold by uh, consultants in, in industry. Um, all right, great. Um, how about Julian? Okay, Julian asks, um, for new, for new starting business, how would I interpret CRM into my business if it were, if it were only me and my father? That's the first section of the question. The second part is also I'm going to be getting my in, I'm going to be getting my license in construction and help my father build his business. What segmentation would be recommended on concentrating? Great question. So let me let me take a crack at the first of his two questions. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's new, starting a new business. How do you or do you bring CRM into your business? And and I'm a big advocate as early as possible of bringing customer relationship management system into your business. Now, there was a time when a lot of this was done in three by five cards before it became automated. But um, <laughs> one, one of the things you, you're going to need to realize you don't sense it now is as your business starts to grow your your customers are actually going to bring you new customers and new business and it's going to get more and more difficult to keep track of that it's a new startup company you might have 20 30 customers you know them all by their first name you know who they are you have contact with them when you get to 60 and 70 you start to lose that touch and maybe the way to think of it this way <clears throat> is that as your business matures you're going to have to segment your customers into two or three buckets because all your customers are not equal. They're, they're all equal day one because your first customer is the same as the second, the third, and fourth, but your 500th and first customer is not the same as your 500 and second customer. And so here's what has to happen. As you collect data and you build these relationships, you start to segment. For the first segmentation is everybody's an A customer. They order, they pay their bill, maybe they do repeat business. Then as you, your number of customers grows, you have a, a second segment called the B customer. And then as it gets larger, you have C. So let's, in my example, ABC, the way it would work in your and dad's construction company is you get a call from a potential customer to build a home. They're gonna come into your system as a B, meaning you're not sure whether they're a really good A customer or someone you want to quiet file because you can't make money at it or it's not, doesn't fit your business. So they come in as a B. As you develop that relationship, you move them out of that B category into A or C. And the, and the way this becomes a reality is that <clears throat> approximately 20% of your customer base are going to be A's. And that's where you make all your money. You make all your money and all your profit. They're, they're customers who order, they pay on time, they reorder, they're easy to deal with, they're not burdens on your service side of your business, um, you're not problem solving, <clears throat> uh, and you're, what you're trying to do is break the level of service so that the A customers get your very best time and effort, and the Bs, until they, they emerge, are going to get some kind of standardized level of service, and the Cs, you're really trying to quiet file. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you one wrap up. Kind of example, <clears throat> I'm consulting with a company. Uh, they have, I'm talking to the owners, so three of them. I asked, okay, how many customers do you have? And they said, we have over 500 customers. And I said, well, you have 500 accounts, but how many customers do you have? And they said, well, we don't understand what you mean. And I said, well, go on, let's do a printout of from the, the highest uh, paying customer to the lowest paying customer and bring the printout into the room. So they ran the printout and I took a, a line about 20% out of 500, about 100. I took the top 100, drew a line, added up all the revenue from those top 100. It ended up being 98.4% of their gross revenue for the previous year. In other words, they could have fired 400 customers that took up time on, with questions on orders, late pays, 
all kinds of things. And they could have gotten rid of those and only focused on 100 and still had almost the same amount of revenue. Now, is your you and your dad going to have 500 customers? I don't know. But you don't want to start CRM when you have that kind of size business because it's almost impossible to do and do well. That's my, my take on this first question. I think that's a great take, Steve. I don't have much more. I don't have anything more to add to that, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, why, don't right. you, why don't you take a crack at a second question? Okay, we'll do. That sounds good to me. Um, the second part of the question was um, talking about um, what segmentation would I recommend or would we recommend um, for them to actually look at. I think you need to, first of all, Julian, look at, you know, what your skill set is. You know, what, what market can you go after? As far as construction, do you want private? Do you want commercial? Do you want um, residential? What are you looking for? Where does, what kind of equipment do you have? And what kind of skill set do you have? So you can narrow it down and begin from there. After that, then you wanna narrow it down just a little bit farther. You wanna go into, do you wanna do private housing? Do you wanna do uh, educational facilities? Do you wanna do commercial buildings? What kinds of things do you want to do? I think that you can take a look at that. And um, so you want to focus down as much as you can and concentrate on what's going to make you money. And I think that that's the important part. You can't be in a business, of course, and just break even. You have to, you have to have some sort of profit margin there. So you need to take a look at what you can do, what you can do most efficiently, and what you do best. And then when you want to maybe reach out to those customers after you've decided you know where where you want to concentrate your efforts as far as um, your marketing goes you can reach out and look for clients in uh, in different places different clients are going to use different um, avenues um, avenues to um, to actually find you and you find them so you want to look for what 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 kind of customers where do they frequent what do they do where do they go what do they read those kinds of things so you know how to reach out to them um it, if you are looking for residential you would probably want to do your advertising or um promotions uh in real estate investment websites and magazines um that that are involved in in that type of business so you want to figure out who your clients really are and how you can best take care of them and that will feed into your profit margin and also build your clientele like steve was talking about earlier That's and then better. you've got your yeah you've got your um You've got your, um, uh, uh, your, your, gosh, I'm, your, your CRM <laughs> that you can fall back on as well. So that will give you all those bases to work from. That's great. Great, Susie. Um, my, my only build would be that maybe, maybe take a piece of paper with your dad and brainstorm the perfect customer and think of five, no more than seven attributes. If you had 100 perfect best customers what do they all have in common and you 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 want to just kind of brainstorm that there's no right really right or wrong answer in this stage but it's a question you, you always want to ask yourself uh about your business is who's your perfect customer so f for you and your dad in segmenting a market one of the things you want to try to consider is the, the amount of risk you're going to take with a particular segment you choose. So for example, you could be on the low end of the residential commercial or residential market where you're doing high volume. You're building less expensive homes, entry level homes, first time buyer homes. Um, there's, you're doing large numbers. So in, in one sense, you're getting, uh, it's a little safer because the risk of failure on one particular home if you're building a hundred a year is smaller. Um, but in the production side, there's other risks, like you have to find land. Um, if you're going to build 50 homes in a, in a track, you got to find the land and buy the land, lock the land up. That gets, that, that can get risky that way. On the other end of the scale, you could say my best customer is going to be someone who wants to buy a million dollar plus home. And you're going to be hiring subcontractors who are artisans in uh, tile and granite and, and painters that are really at the top of their game and you're going to get you're going to build a lot fewer homes but your profit margin is going to be a lot larger and the argument is that these people who are in the market for a million dollar home are people who can 
pay for that. So <laughs> you, you're, you, if it's going to be a small scale company, focus on the high end, that brings some risks and thought to the process. If you're going to be a, a, a production organization, you're going to need more employees, you're going to need more services, and, and, and as Susie said, more equipment. You're going to be moving things around. It's a much bigger operation. Neither one necessarily is better than the other. In the end, it really is, what are you and your dad comfortable with? You know, where do you want to go with this? Um, so, it, yeah, that would be a, a, a start. Um, yeah, and as Susie mentioned again, CRM, um, if I'm going to prospect, if I if if I joined your dad and you to build a construction company, and I were looking for prospects, one of the things I would do is go look for people who are doing construction loans. And there are banks do construction loans. Uh, it used to be that uh, savings and loans were the ones that did con uh, construction mm -hmm. loans, but you've got credit unions now. You've got private enterprise that are doing, you know, on big big homes many times banks aren't doing the loans on them because they don't want to be in that mic alone market. So they charge for that. So there are different resources for mega mansions or big, big homes that you want to start building relationships with. Because if I'm going to build a home, I have to, first thing I have to figure out is, you know, where am I going to get my money? So I'm going to start talking to banks and credit unions and other sources to end the beginning stage. And you want a banker to say, to someone who wants a large loan, I, you know, I've got a perfect builder for you. Here's a guy you need to talk to, or a woman you need to talk to, whatever it is. So those are some things to think about. But you, you really want to begin with the end in mind. Where, where are you and your dad sitting 10 years from now, and you've built homes? What, where do you take your expertise, your pride, your business risks, and start there? All right, well, good. That was week six. Should we dive into week seven? Sounds good to me. Okay, so I'll let's reverse the order. I'll read the questions this time, and then um, we'll we'll kick it around. So Effie on week seven asks, "How is the previous experience relevant to this role in analyzing a recent experience?" And so it's a little hard to kind of sort out what Effie might be asking for. I mean, Susie, do you have a, a thought on this? Or well, I, I yes, and I do. Um, when you have a previous experience, Effie, no matter really what it what it is, it, a, a life experience or uh, any kind of experience that you, it gives you background, so you can make a better decision, and it gives you knowledge uh, of the result of that decision. So if you have been through a situation before, it actually gives you a basis to start working from. What happened? Was it good? Was it bad? You know, um, outline it and figure out what the what you want from that situation. So, if again, if it were a bad situation, you could figure out, okay, this was the problem. This is what I could have done differently. Um, and then it, it's it's kind of a trial and error sort of situation. But this way, it doesn't have to be trial and error because you have that experience already, and you can make those decisions from what you already know and what you've already learned. Um, especially you know in 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 what i do it's it it's all about timing and so if i've had an experience where i have had a hang up in my distribution line or how i'm getting from one place to another i know to avoid that and i know how to fix it because i've been through it before so i think the whole thing here is that if you have had all these experiences, you can kind of put them all together and use them to your benefit to make things better and more efficient for what you're doing. That's great. Um, I, I would probably take a simple crack at this and just say, we all have experiences in buying products and services. And one of the measurements we, we use when we're going to make a choice, we're gonna exchange money for a service, for example, is what we're told to expect and what we actually get. And if there's a difference, and we'll talk about this in a little bit about gaps, yes. but um, if, if, if you've set my expectations through your television radio ads, like Les Schwab, if, if the service manager didn't run out to my car like they do in the TV ads, you know, I didn't get that experience. So does that make me not buy tires there anymore? No, but it's, it's a difference. It's a measurable, uh, impactful difference. Another thing that happens with the previous experience is that 
you can work so hard as an organization to provide a great service to a customer that you cannot repeat it. But I walk away thinking this is a great organization as a customer because they went above and beyond with their service. The next time I go to your company, I expect the same level of experience. If I get something less, now I start to wonder, you know, should I trust your organization or your product? You know, because I've it, it's it's another way to think of this is one of the things McDonald's wrings their hands over is that they want to be sure that when you walk into a McDonald's in Portland, you get a Big Mac that has a certain weight, smell, taste to it. And then when you're in London, England, and you walk into a burger or to a McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, you you know your customers are expecting that same smell and taste. So they work really hard to ensure that all their franchises are providing a product that has some standard of experience so it's not disappointing because disappointing leads to distress which leads to losing business so that, that's just a different way to say it uh okay i think we clobbered that one pretty good um, <laughs> all right moving on yeah moving on brody um asks when it describes empathy is it wanting the producer to overemphasize Empathize. Let me read that again. When it describes empathy, is it wanting the producer to over empathize their respect for the customer or be subtle and polite? So um, I guess when the text describes empathy, does the producer over empathize or just respect and be polite? It's an interesting. Let me, let me kind of start this one off. Um, I think one of the things that is important is to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy. Um, empathy would be me listening to you, Brody, about some experience, some circumstance. And, and if, I'm if I'm empathizing with you, I'm listening carefully to try to understand how you feel, but I don't necessarily agree with you. Sympathy, on the other hand, is me working at the same kind of effort trying to understand, but in that case, I'm trying to, I, I'm also agreeing with what you're saying, and I'm actually giving you feedback that I agree with you. So sympathizing and empathizing are, are two different things. Businesses really work hard to empathize with their customer, and they will say occasionally here, this a customer's always right. Well, a customer's not always right. And that would be sympathizing with the customer, that they are right when they're not. So. Empathy is is a, a subtle kind of um, way of me listening to you, Brody, complain about my service product, not getting defensive, listening carefully, looking for, as Susie has said, th those little nuggets that you can learn from, so you can't, you don't make this mistake a second time. Um, but I I may not come away with this discussion with Brody with you with any benefit except the fact that you felt that I was trying to understand you. And that's enough. If, if I'm working to understand you, I, I don't agree with you. I mean, you, you know, you, you can tell me, I, me and my employees are idiots and they don't, they don't care. I don't agree with that, but I understand that's how you feel. That's empathy. Anyway. And, and I think, Steve, that, that's an excellent point to make, actually. Uh, to me, I, I kind of visualize it as a, as a service person um, and in my in what I do, service is extremely important. That empathy to me is putting myself in the customer's place. How is the customer feeling? How are they seeing this? What what uh, what? How are they interpreting what kind of service they're getting and so on? You have to be able to determine where they're coming from in order to improve the situation that they're in. And we want that. We want to be able to give service the best possible service to every customer that we have. And if we don't know how they're feeling about it, then we really don't know how to give them that best service. So I think knowing how they feel and actually trying to put yourself in a place to know what they're going through is really, really difficult. I, I have to give this example right now. I am uh, having, I'm struggling with a certain uh, 
carrier provider for my phone. And um, anyway, I cannot get through to a human being. I am trying and trying and trying and trying, been trying for four days. I cannot get a human being. We've had this account for 30 years. I don't remember the PIN number. I don't remember the, the my password. And so I've tried so many times I've blocked myself out. And mm. now I can't get anybody on the phone. I'm so frustrated I want to throw something. <laughs> This is an example. So can I, if I could get somebody on the phone, would they empathize with me? I don't know for sure. But this is what I'm saying. You've got to know where your customer's coming from and you've got to be able to um, feel what they're feeling to, in order to help them and, and in order to get them ahead. So it's very important that you can relate to your customer. And service is everything. I mean, if you don't have service, you might as well not have a product. And, and that's how I feel right now. After 30 years of being with this particular company, I'm feeling like it's time to change. Mm. So this is an example, I think, of, of feeling what your customers are feeling. Yeah, It's a good point. I mean, it, it, most of us have gone through Starbucks at one point in expecting an order that we put in. We got something very different. And if you've ever gone to the window and said, you start to say, well, I, I got this drink. It's not my." They are immediately apologizing and giving you a free drink. And I mean, it, it's like they took the sting right out of that whole process. So, right. yeah, I, 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 you're, you're right. I, it, relationships, however they're defined by the customer, are really important to treat carefully. Because not only will your cut, like in your case, if let's say it's um, AT&T is your carrier, uh, not only will you cancel it, you're going to tell everybody you know about AT&T. Exactly. Exactly yeah. right. Yep. Yep. My whole family's going to know about this company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and AT&T is my example. Not, uh, is that, <laughs> I, I actually, that's not mine, but it's... <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, that was good. Let's uh, move on to Kimberly. Uh, I'll read Kimberly's question. She says, in sustainable supply management, how does it work in the current market with a lot of items being delayed or not enough people to transport goods? Question mark. How would one company manage to keep their products stocked at retailers in this current situation of less available truck drivers and in some cases, less production than demand? So it's sustainable supply management. Um, it's an interesting question because we're right in the middle of this. Um, where there's the, the distribution systems are breaking down. A lot of it, I mean, there's five ways to move your product. You can do it by truck, you can do it by plane, you can do it by boat, you can do it by pipeline, or you can do it by, let's see if I can remember this. I, did I say truck already? Yes. Okay, so then, <laughs> so let's go again. It's truck, boat, boat plane, plane, pipeline, and I'll think of the set. I, I used to be able to do this right off the top of my head. And I, I just, I think I'm um, getting conflicted. But anyway, any thoughts on that question? Um, actually, I, I think that you are right. We are really in the middle of this kind of situation. And, and, and how do you really prepare for this kind of thing? It, it's not something that, of course, you go through every day. But I think that you need to be prepared for those kinds of situations. Um, Establishing, you know, what what a, a list of critical components, determining the origin of your supply, and identifying all alternative sources is is really really very important. You have to have a, a plan B. You have to have a plan B in any kind of situation like that. Um, you also need to be aware of available inventory. What do I have now? What's moving off the shelves so quickly? what will we need to um, establish and you know how how do we really optimize production and distribution when when you get into those kinds of situations how you you have to have a pretty good handle on how your business is run um and what products sell what products don't sell in order to be able to um uh, shore up that that pipeline or or mode of transportation and if one mode of transportation isn't working or is disrupted then you need to move to another mode of, of distribution and so on so I, I think that this is 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 really um a, a, um a product by product kind of scenario because <clears throat> some solutions will work for one that won't work for another and and again you have to have a really tight supply chain and you have to know your vendors and you have to know how they work and and what their capabilities are as well yeah 
good point. I, it, well, okay, let me give it another shot at this. It's plane, <laughs> boat, train. So when I forgot. Train. Oh pipe, yes, yes. Pipeline and truck. So, you know, and Susie's, Susie's right on. I, it, um, and running a business, depending if it's local, state, regional, national, or global, you what we're talking about is logistics. Basically, it, it's the moment the product leaves the back dock until it gets in the hands of the customer. And you've got all kinds of issues. Um, you know, in, in the case of um, which method you choose to distribute will add or subtract costs to that. So, for example, most of all the plastic manufacturers in the United States are located in the United States. They don't produce plastic packaging in China and ship it to the United States because it's too expensive. It would be prohibited. So there's a natural um, protection in the, in the plastic packaging market. Uh, another example would be, you've got politics at play. Um, Berkshire Hathaway owns all of the rail stock, all the cars, and that's, um, uh, yeah, Berkshire Hathaway. So um, when the XL pipeline was being uh, completed between Canada and uh, the Gulf, um, that was going to take potential transportation revenue away from Berkshire Hathaway's uh, trucking, they did all the trucking because I'm sorry, that it, it was uh, it was going to take it away from the, the rail because they were they were Berkshire Hathaway uses rail to move petroleum all around the country and it's a great sweet spot for them. The XL pipeline was actually going to take away a significant part of that, so the Berkshire Hathaway company lobbied Congress hard to cancel or limit the XL pipeline because it would take revenue away. Now you won't read that, you have to go digging for it, but those are some of the things that go on behind it. It's not just a natural disaster or or something that affects one of those five methods of moving things around. So um, yeah, it, it, it uh, give you one more example. Amazon almost forever was shipping everything through FedEx. And then they realized, someone took a pencil to it and realized they can own their own planes, their own pilots, and have their own distribution system and not pay FedEx. And that's exactly what they did. So Amazon has their own distribution system now with airplanes um, and they compete with FedEx. So uh, complicated question, supply chain management. In terms of careers, I would say from, from a long-term standpoint, this is one of the best paths to look at. Uh, it's not gonna stop, it's, it's constant movement and there's a high demand for talent in the logistics area, how to move things from point A to point B using those five methods I mentioned. Well, and Steve, we didn't even touch on nas nas uh, natural disasters mm. or wars or, you know, there's so many things that can disrupt that distribution line. There's just mm -hmm. so many things out there. So you, you really do have to have a plan B. And, and like you said, oh my goodness, you know, the opportunities for um, actual employment and so on, uh, especially in the higher um, upper echelon of management is is phenomenal i mean you like you said it, it won't go away we have to move product and we are so dependent on import that um we have to get it from one place to another so yeah yep. and, and with just one more footnote world war ii that was the name of the game was disrupting yeah. supply lines yep. and and both sides got very creative in, in using uh drones and other things to try to move people and supplies because that was the way you won a battle it was you, you cut off the supply lines right okay even in the civil war they tore up all the train tracks yes so, same thing yeah <laughs> yeah exactly that's a great point it's, um so yeah supply lines been around forever and, and it will be a really uh strong opportunity going forward for from a career standpoint mm -hmm. um all right so let's go we've got one more question from julian um Julian asks, uh, this is regarding the GAP model. In the GAP model, it mentions that uh, it identifies five gaps that can cause problems in service delivery and influence customer evaluation of service quality. His question, is there a possible way to bypass any of these problems that can interfere with any service delivery or influence on customer service? So in the five gaps are um, primarily what what the customer wants and what management thinks the customer wants and the breakdown in communication understanding those two perspectives and that that's part of what creates these gaps so susan do you have uh, any any thoughts on that well 
Yes, I do actually. Um, I I think that if when you when you start your business and you start your business plan, that these the, this is just an indication of situations between um, the company and the customer and expectations and so on. When you look to avoid those, not all companies have all five of these gaps. So your company may only have three of these gaps and there are ways to close those gaps, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have to deal with all of these. So Julian, when you said bypass, some um, of these gaps may not apply to your company once you get it up and rolling. You may have already taken care of that, but there are certain ways that you can take care of some of the gaps and, and how you can close that area. You, you have to particularly look at at your service and, and the, the perception of what your customer is looking for. And co companies may want to provide items and, and services to their customers that their customers don't need or really don't even want. So it's it this whole idea of the gap is just trying to look at where your customers are, what their needs are, and what their wants are, and how to fulfill that, and how to also track that. And that's important as well. So you have to know, you have to have a grading system that you can follow so you know where your weaknesses are. You know, you do that SWOT analysis. So you have to know how to use your gap as well to not only better your service, better your company, but also how to improve the bottom line. So once you fulfill these gaps and you get these gaps closed a little bit more tightly, your bottom line is going to um, automatically rise. So you need to be aware of of how all of these things tie together. Um, I guess that's it for me, Steve, yeah. Okay, no, that's great. Um, I would say, <clears throat> if you if you look at the five gaps, it, it really is a miscommunication between the provider of the product or service and the customers Customer. ultimately gonna get it. And if you look at it, most of the mistakes, when you say bypassing, what I'm thinking about is, um, if I could get my organization to stop thinking about how they think the product should work, think something about the product, and start thinking about how the customer has a problem to solve. And we may or may not have the product, but we need to start thinking about the customer. The, the more time my company can spend focusing on listening to the customer's problems, a lot of these gaps go away because mm -hmm. we begin to really understand you know, a lot of us have problems and issues and we'll express them in certain ways. But if somebody's listening to us, many times what we're expressing is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. And what companies will do is they'll hear a cup on a survey, they'll hear a customer say, you know, I always want in my products to have X, Y, and Z. And so a company races off and builds a product with X, Y, and Z. Well, what, what they didn't hear was that X, Y, and Z provides a benefit that's what I'm really looking for. It's not the features X, Y, and Z. It's that for me, it's this benefit. Well, I missed the whole point. There, there's meetings going on at Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble right now where they're developing a new hand soap or a diaper and they're not talking to the customer. They're not talking to the market. They're gonna build it and they will come, you know? And, <laughs> and the, when the customer doesn't buy the dog food, they scratch their heads and say, well, we've got all these surveys. We know what they did. You know, <laughs> no, you didn't know. So when you say, when, when Julian says, or Julian says, um, you know, how do I bypass this? It's, it's really not so much bypassing. It's maybe putting the burden on the customer to tell you what they really, really want and, and listening very carefully. So that, that would be my bill one. One of, right. the, one of the traps, let me add one more thing. One of the traps that businesses get into when they have salespeople is the salespeople are depending, again, somehow it has to do with how they're compensated, but they're driven to make the sale. And many times salespeople may exaggerate a benefit or an expectation to get the sale done. And that sets up this gap model where the customer doesn't get what they were expecting. Um, right. Salesman gets the sale, gets paid, but you know that's another right. kind of 
problem. Okay. Right. And, and Steve, you're absolutely right. As a salesperson for my almost entire career, um, that is that is so true. You're, you're so concentrated on making that sale that you, you, you create an expectation that's not possible to meet. And that's when you run into trouble. And, and again, like you said, you, you've got the sale, you've got the money and you're out of there. But that used to always bother me. I, I would, I tried very hard not to oversell for the simple fact that these customers are going to come back to me and I'm going to have to deal with them in the future. So yeah. I don't want them angry at me. Right. <laughs> but I think you made a great point when you said, um, that, that the customer needs to tell us what they want and, and that's entirely true, but we have to listen. That is, I think the key right there is that a lot of times people hear what they want to hear. And, and that that's not going to fly. We've got to learn how to listen. There are certain ways that you that you have to listen. There are certain questions that you have to ask in order to get the answers that you want. But once you get those answers, again, you've got to listen to what your customer is saying to you. You can't just say, oh, yeah, that's right. But it's not. You know, you really have to analyze what they're trying to tell you so you don't create that expectation loss or lag or, or whatever you want to call it. You know, it, it's it's got to be it's it's got to be customer oriented. You've got to know what they want, and you've got to hear what they're saying. So, it, 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 I, it, Susie has experienced this, I know, and I and I certainly have. <clears throat> Some of the most successful salespeople in the world, seven figure plus, uh, I could introduce you to them, and you would never guess they were in sales. They were, yeah. But they are so good at asking good questions and listening very carefully and they know their customers problems better than the customers do mm -hmm. and and in some cases they're if you listen to them talk about problem solving it almost sounds like they're trying to unsell the product because they're being brutally honest about what the right. problem is and how the product does or doesn't work now oddly enough you would think by being brutally honest you set yourself up for losing sales what you end up doing is actually making more sales because people know you're being honest and trustworthy. Right. And it's it's a contrarian kind of a thing here. And it, But a lot of that's embedded in core corporate training and, and the way sales are driven through commissions and other things. A lot of this stuff gets lost because it's a skill listening right. the way Susan's mm -hmm. describing it. Uh, it is more than hearing the words and it's more than reading the facial expressions. There's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, skills, and I don't pretend to have those skills. I can recognize them when I see them, but um, really successful salespeople don't sell like we think selling's supposed to be. It's it's almost really interesting kind of a, a, a way to go about it. But yeah, that would be my my good. Exactly, and and I just want to emphasize for one word, Stephen, and and that's trust. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned trust and you've got to have that with your customers. They have to trust you and they have to trust your judgment and they have to trust your product. So that's really super important. So listening and trust are, are you, you just have to have them. Yeah, they are. They're absolutely huge. And again, it, it can make you or break you depending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Um, I think we did a great job speaking for ourselves. Yes, uh, very good. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's go after another week. If you find you've got something that's confusing or something about the course that doesn't make sense or any other random question, jump into that forum, uh, Ball of Confusion Forum, post your, your question. You'll get a one point extra credit for it. And Susan and I will deal with that question the following week. So with that, I'm going to say we are done with this particular week, week seven, and look forward to week eight. Excellent. Me too. All right. Bye. All right.